Hello. So we'll actually everybody comes to the stage and we'll do the introduction. It's easier. All right. Are we ready? We are. Everybody is. Yep. So as uh, Luis said, we're going to talk how to build uh, multi-product companies or how to have uh, companies which have bigger value proposition or offering than, than just one, one simple uh, service or product. Um, and instead of me going over who we have on stage, so let them introduce themselves and then tell us what they've done in the past. Why are they the experts here on stage? So let's start with Matt. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Matt Dalsgaard. I am with Thunderbeam. I'm not one of the founders, but I've previously been a founder myself. Uh, in another company, and right now I'm on the marketing side, uh, promoting the different products that we have at Thunderbeam, um, which is, I guess, why I, I'm here today to talk about this. My name is Olaf. Uh I'm uh, from Tallinn. Uh, Twelve years ago, I founded a time tracking tool called Toggle, and fast forward today, we have uh, three companies, uh, three different products. Uh, which have grown out of Toggle. My name is Ten, and uh, at Topia, Topia is a, is a company that acquired a company that they founded called Teleport. Um, and as a result of that acquisition and one more, we went from a one product company into a suite of applications to serve large companies' needs to move their people around the planet. Um, and this sort of multi-product topic is also also familiar to me from, from quite a few years at Skype, where where uh, in any product engineering sort of work, uh, you always had to contemplate, uh, like, do, do, do we add new products on new platform, which the Skype case was speci specific because we had the same feature set, the same functionality of the product. The question was that, okay, when do you launch it on iPhone? Do you launch it on a BlackBerry and so forth, so forth. Okay. And BlackBerry went well, I, I imagine, It's right? fantastic. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, before we get into the discussions, and uh, I'm Martin, uh, part of a company called Fortumo, so uh, we're most known as, as the company who, who does mobile payments, but yeah, throughout 11 years, we've, we've done all sorts of crazy stuff uh, and different products. Today, we're sort of running a digital enablement platform where, where yeah, we're servicing different customer groups, um, uh, addressing their uh, user acquisition, monetization, and, and uh, retention management needs. So, um, yeah, multi-product uh, pains and, and challenges is, is uh, very dear to me. So if somebody could solve them, it would be awesome. So that's why we have this panel. Um, so that, um, how to do it better? Um, idea is let's kick off with our own experience and let's uh, take the discussion forward. So. Let's start from the very beginning. Uh, you have a startup, you're doing well or semi-well, and then, uh, um, I don't know, maybe you read a book or uh, you saw a need and then you start thinking, maybe I should have some sort of additional value offering, um, additional service. So how to get there, how to understand whether it's viable, how to understand whether there is a market and then how to sort of kick it off. And, Maybe let's start with, with Alari this time. Uh, you, ha you, are, you have this super traditional uh, model, different businesses, different products. So how, how did you end up doing something else than Doggo? So I guess the main, like, uh, how it started was uh, we needed something uh, for ourselves. So in case of uh, uh, Toggle back then, before we had started out to toggle as, as a company we were a consultancy and we needed to track track the work time and back like 2004 we couldn't find any 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 like good product on the market so it was like okay let's do it ourselves uh, so next next product we released a uh, few years ago was now it's called team week which is a team planning tool and uh, if you if your team grows you have like 20 30 people like uh, always the biggest question is that uh, okay John what what is John doing next week <laughs> and uh, if John falls ill then 
uh, who is uh, taking over. So it's, it's always, always like juggling. So like visual planning, we started out in Excel. We did an Excel sheet, used it ourselves, and then we thought that, okay, maybe we can uh, spin it out also as a product. How, how did you validate it? I mean, you had an idea, you built it something for yourself, but what next? How to validate? Did a Google ad or? I, I don't believe uh, I don't believe in uh, market research, because uh, uh, if you ask people, like Henry Ford said that, if you ask people, then they would ask for a faster horse. So at some point, you need to show people something, a product, and uh, then the market validates. So I believe that uh, you you should release and then see what happens on the market. Okay. So then you 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 launched, I think hundreds of products. Yeah, I think I think the. The way I think about it is that there are some products that are born by customer pull, and there are some products that are born by the team push. And the difference there is that, for example, if you already have a product on the market, like let's say uh, in case of Topia, we, we, we can run large companies' relocation programs software first. So if they need to move a person from A to B, uh, then, then they, um, uh, like we can integrate with the companies who ship your stuff and, and manage the finances around that and payments and so forth. So that is a product. Now the very same customer that is using that product says that, hey, I want to have a reliable cost estimate for that upcoming move. And that is something that when you start working on it, then, then a big part of the discussion is, is that something that you can build? Is that something that you should partner with somebody? Is that something you should buy outside? Is that really a feature in an existing product or could it be a separate product? And there are tons of frameworks of how to structure that sort of product strategy discussions, and which I will not uh, dwell deep into that. But, but that's, that's sort of a flow that you can go through. And then basically you have this clarity of mind uh, that you're building something that the customers are pulling and the other thing is that you have a very, in order to test the hypothesis that it is really a product, you also know specifically who to go and talk to. Basically, you're already talking to them. These are your existing customers. If they like it, if they're willing to pay more to buy it, uh, then you can sort of assume and expand that you can sell it to others as well. The other, I think, interesting approach is this sort of team push. And that's something that we experimented a lot with at, uh, at Teleport when we started out four years ago, was basically we decided that we we, 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 we started a seed stage company. We raised a notable amount of capital uh, on a vision, and basically vision and then founders was our pitch. That, hey, we want to do something about human mobility. We don't know what the product will be, but here's the sort of stuff that we're going to experiment with. And, and that meant that we actually, in the first few years of the company, we launched dozens, probably 10, 12 separate things that looked like a product. Because we, we used the same data set, the same technology, but we experimented with the user experience. We built a tool for people to search for where they should live. Then we take, took the same data set and built a separate thing uh, where, which allowed teams to figure out where they should meet. What, what is the cost and commute optimal place in the world for a distributed team to meet? And we call the first thing teleport, and we call the same, second thing teleport flock. And that allowed us like put things on the market and really validate with working prototypes if there is any traction and what works and what doesn't. And th for things that don't work, and most of them don't, like we could throw it away very easily because it didn't demolish the first, like the core brand and the core offering and so forth. So it's, it's sometimes launching small products or small experiments and making them look like products is actually a great way of validating before you even know if there is any pull for it at all. Okay. I think, I mean, just to add to, I think what you also touched in, which is, which is really interesting to discuss as part of this is what's, what is a feature and what is a separate product. And I think most of the products, like all the products we talked about here are somewhat like born out of ideas for features that are either coming from the team or from the clients that you have. And then at some point you have to decide like, okay, is this something that we're going to build? How do we validate it? Can we find like, I, we want at least, I believe quite a lot in testing with the users also just by asking and seeing if you can actually validate the, the ideas that have come up either from the team or from the clients. But then saying like, I mean, for us, we're, we're a platform for managing investing. So voting is something that has been requested or talked about for a long time, but we don't want to start building something until we actually have someone like who's actually a paying client saying like, okay, this is something that we need to have, and then we can build it as a feature. And then if it works well, validating that feature is then actually the the way to go, and then maybe it becomes a separate product later. There is, uh, there is a friend of probably a few hours, Hen Ukel, who is the founder of Fleep. Uh, there is a principle called the Hen's Axe Principle, 
which he, he uses to talk about products versus features. Uh, and this is like, if you have a perfectly good ax, and one morning you go to the shed to chop some firewood, and you discover that the ax has grown a toothbrush. Now, this is not the great ax anymore, and it's probably not the great toothbrush. And this is what happens if you try to push like, like two diverging features into one product. And if you had built the separate axe and sec separate toothbrush, actually would have happy customers for both. Like firewood gets chopped and teeth get cleaned, but this sort of axe with a toothbrush is not appealing to anybody. And you'd, you'd actually don't learn if, if somebody would use it, the products. Yeah, this, this is what happened to Evernote, right? So they had, were so feature rich, so nobody wanted the pro or a paid version because the free was already like doing everything, cooking yeah. as well. Uh, but it, now when you've sort of discovered, understood, validated uh, that, OK, uh, there is an opportunity. It's not a feature. It could be, could be a standalone product, platform, company. Then the most difficult part is like, OK, what next? I mean, you think, OK, Taxify thinks, let's go to e-scooters. Awesome. So w what next? Like, what should you do? How to be successful? How not to screw it up? Like, yeah, I think that, uh, so, if, so I guess that, that at this point when you are considering having a new product that you are already having some kind of success with the existing uh, company, with the existing product, and with the success uh, comes uh, certain confidence that you know how things are like going, you know that you are doing well, and how hard can it be to launch a new product. It's so, a bad place already yeah. to be, yeah. Yeah, so I think that one mistake that people can easily make is that they don't m put enough effort or they don't put enough uh, 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 attention to the new product because it's a totally new thing. Uh, you, uh, nothing is forgiven. Uh, so uh, it, uh, so to, is to, to reach this escape velocity of a new product actually being successful, it requires uh, full attention of, uh, of a founder, I would even say that. You know. Because what I've seen is that if, if you have a successful company and you start doing a new product, like your second one, then oftentimes you also have those challenges that, okay, like engineers, we have to work with the old stack and some other guys can build the new cool stuff. Uh, then on the other side, if you have a successful company that has meaningful results, then to sort of do it within the same organization then actually that new thing will have a tiny little effect. And then the, sort of there, there is a competition internally. Like, what are your experiences? How to do it successfully, not to, not to end up in a place where some people are dealing with cool stuff and, and at the same time the cool stuff doesn't bring in money and how to manage that. So I th it's the most common thing, I guess. Yeah. It, it was at Skype, we had this period where I was, I was running a team where we were experimenting with what are the ways of making money outside of telecom services. And it's super hard uh, when you have a billion dollars coming from telecom services. Because you come to a fantastic startup idea, and a year later you have $10 million in revenue, then you have 1% of the company, nobody cares. So, so, so it is a real problem. Um, one theme that, that actually, right now, I, I have uh, a lot of discussions with my team uh, about is this notion of, uh, uh, like the metaphor that I'm thinking about, that there is a great sports team needs people playing defense and people playing offense. And, and defense in this case is like defending the revenue, serving the existing customers, um, uh, serving the new sales of the current product, getting customers live, like all of these activities. And Atopia, after sort of merging three companies, we're currently, we have tens of millions of, of uh, annual revenue run rate, and, and we have um, about hundreds sort of very large enterprise customers. So, so defending that, 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 keeping those customers happy is like a real job. Like you can't do it after work. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the offensive activities, which is, which is like building for the roadmap, building for the future, spinning out this new feature, new idea, new product potentially. And, and it's, it's a very important to recognize that uh, winning teams need both. Like you need both people who are defending your goal and hitting the, the opponent's goal. Like you cannot like let this culture sneak in that one is superior to another. And I think that's something that you see in large enterprises very often is that they create this innovation department, which implicitly says that nobody else is innovating. <laughs> Yeah. And that's the wrong place where you want to be. So, so, so that's, I think there is a lot about language, a lot about culture, a lot about uh, how you talk about these things and how you motivate and help people understand that 
regardless of which part they're working on, they're contributing to the overall company goal. But there, it also requires, I think, um, uh, a certain amount of separation. Separate budget, dedicated team, like you cannot expect your greatest talent to do both uh, and so they would just go crazy or, or something urgent with, from current customers comes in and they stop developing the next product which will delay it like a year later. So. How, how have you done it? I think yeah, exactly this resource allocation is, is, is the key because it's very easy to be pulled back and to put out fires when, when the sort of revenue is in danger, right? I mean, I think it's just, it's just about making the, making the priorities and, and if, you've made, if you made a decision that this is something that you want to pursue, then you have to also be willing to, to kind of see it through and at, at the end of the day, it comes down to having a strong executive team who, who like, retains the decisions that have been made and a board that isn't like going to say in the one board meeting, okay, let's chase after this really cool idea and then you start building it and then on the next cycle, they're like, wait, isn't it any further along? Well, then we're never going to get it before we need to do the next round. And, and you have to believe in some ideas. They might take more time than where you can actually show results in that, in that funding circle that you're in. But if you, if you don't try it, then like, it's, it's not going to work out. And what I see the, the mistake is then that people rush too much to bring some sort of MVP to the market to, to test it and to validate it. And it's just so minimal and not very viable that they just see like, oh, okay, people don't like this, so we shouldn't pursue it. But you haven't actually given it the chance that it deserves. Mm -hmm. well, okay, we had a case where uh, we had a new CFO a few years ago and she joined the board meeting and uh, looked at the numbers and one of the first things she asked us that, hey guys, that when are you going to close down uh, this uh, team week project <laughs> because you're bleeding money and uh, and the only thing i could say her was that uh, I, i'm sorry i don't have any like uh, any numbers now only thing i have is belief <laughs> so yeah you you need to have a lot of belief ever the first few years which is very very important with a new new product yeah. i mean sort of what I was trying to get is, I think it's sort of like a mindset or a change in the mindset. So if you're starting the company, you see that as an investment. So this is the investment I need to make and this will start paying off in two, three, whatever years, depending what you're doing. Uh, when you're a more established company, then the projects have return on investment. And oftentimes this, the cycles are shorter, so we want to see results uh, immediately. But um, sort of would get back to something that Alare said. So founders need to be part of uh, new projects, uh, product. Does it always have to be? Is it uh, for from certain size? Some I mean, they have to at least believe in it and, and okay. allocate the resources to it. They should, they should it, know that yeah, something's I mean, going it, on. It depends on how, bi how big is the spin-off that, that you're trying okay. to do. Like, is it like going to absolutely change the business that you're on? Is it, is it a separate product? Are you branding it as a separate product? I, I think that, uh, uh, especially in the beginning, uh, launching a new product or, or launching a new company, it's not a rational thing to do. It, uh, it is uh, a brave thing to do and it needs, uh, yeah, it needs belief and it needs uh, some kind of like risk taking. And, uh, and founders, I guess most of the founders are entrepreneurs, uh, which, uh, which are experienced in risk taking. And if they delegate uh, a new product to someone who is not an entrepreneur, then, uh, then maybe they are lacking this uh, the extra push. Yeah, I think it depends heavily on the size of the company. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you are a 20 person startup where the founder is the utterly ultimate product decision maker, then it has to be the founder. If you have uh, 100 people and you have a few product managers in the company, like I think the way you groom product managers is, is, is like one of the probably overused terms is being a CEO of a product. But I think having a, a product management job in a great growing company is the best training camp for becoming a founder later. So actually assigning a product manager, guaranteeing them resourcing, saying that, okay, I don't care what your hypotheses are, we'll test them out uh, with this resource and we'll, we'll ha let you have them for six months or a year or whatnot. We will not disturb you. That's, I think, is a great way of grooming and growing these product people to actually have like a much more closer experience of what it is to start a company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, I fully agree. It sort of depends on the size, right? Uh, but, but yeah, the main thing is that uh, 
if somebody needs to do something, then yeah, with, with great power comes great responsibility, but that also requires resources. So allocating either money or people and uh, making sure that these people are devoted to something, that's the only way how to succeed. So we've actually sunk a lot of good projects by sharing people between different things. So yeah, it's not like a full-time gig that we're doing. Let's, let's do part-time. We all know where it ends up, but, but we, we still did it several times uh, because we, we thought that we, we can change how things are, are <laughs> going. Um, but we're getting to the place that, okay, so we've built something, it's working, and now there's the question, okay, let's make this a real product, a real, a real company. Um, we won't be able to go into like whether to spin off or do it within the same company, but um, finding the sort of synergies between your existing customers, whether to find them, what are the threats there, uh, and uh, what's the go-to-market, like how to scale the, the new product. <laughs> Three customers, we get some money, we see that this can be working, what next? We, uh, when we started out with Team Week, then the first couple of years we uh, kept it inside like the mother company as a separate department or separate team. Uh, but still the problem was that uh, they, they had this inf inferior like feeling that uh, their product is not the highest priority definitely. <laughs> uh, uh, like all that, even team events, team meetups, meetings, all, all evolved, uh, revolved around Toggle. So they were like just bystanders. And it was, uh, it was not good for m morale, uh, for not good for motivation, and they also had like that maybe it's not so important th these products. So what helped immensely was that when we actually spinned it out as a separate entity uh, with a separate CEO <laughs> and uh, separate uh, total separate team and budget, uh, and then the identity that they and the morale boost that they got from it was. Uh, uh, was very like big, so I, I guess that we should have done it sooner, definitely. Okay. Yeah. I think I think one very important thing mm -hmm. to know is that Toggle is the Estonian mm -hmm. startup scene, is the perpetual uh, bootstrapper of the year, <laughs> like yeah. who has never raised money from outside, and so you have much more control of like do we spin the company out or not. Mm -hmm. I think for venture venture funded startups, the story is a little bit different. Uh, for example, at Topia now we've raised about 100 million dollars uh, from between Series C and Series C. So four rounds. And that means our cap table and our investor structure is already like so multi-layered and, and there are people who are expecting Topia to succeed with what, the, what, what they invested in. So for me, it's almost like a filter that there is, if there is a product that we couldn't sell for our existing sales force to our existing customers to existing pipeline, then we're not going to do it right now because it's it's not the distracting yeah. uh, uh, like focus, which means that it immediately outrules some potentially great ideas that we would like if if we didn't have this sort of uh, sort of the, the 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 structure and the investment uh, investors in the company, we might uh, consider that hey, let's put up a separate company on the side. Like imagine how confused all the VCs would be. Why are you spending time <laughs> on this before you have return yeah. capital on that? Like, so, so so keeping that focus is super important as well. And that might very well be a test. Like can you do it inside the current company? Mm -hmm. Again, like how, how, how to get to the market? So you, you, you sort of established something already. Like how much should you use your existing customers? Should you bother them? De depending like whether there is an overlap or, or should you seek for it? Um, I think the m biggest sort of challenge or ease or struggle is we have a marketing team, we have a sales team. Now we have two products. Why don't we sell them together or uh, I mean, they can do it both. Uh, it's not that difficult. Uh, how much should you separate uh, one from another? Um, I mean, it is it is a real real challenge that you have in the like, especially in a in a startup. You're a small team, so you don't even you don't even maybe have the choice of if are, are you going to split it or are you going to do it together because you can't split one person. So if you only if you only have one person doing AdWords, then you can't say okay. Now you now we yep. split you like and then it becomes like this. Okay, so then like the allocation just of the resources, like the time and the budget, 
or is it is, is it in the amount of attention that you put to it from the from the, in the metrics that you that you run the company the KPIs that you have? Um, I think luckily in our case the the products that we have are so close together that it's it's relatively easy. So if we, I mean, one product is fundraising and another product is is making companies tradable uh, directly, and this is like we can just go to the same company and the pitch is basically. Would you like to raise funds, or would you just like to trade without raising funds? So like then, it's it's my job gets fairly easy. But if we start doing completely different things, then it's very difficult. Okay. Well, why I'm asking, or what I want to rephrase, is that we've we've had several times sort of internal discussions when we do something new, and when you have like a customer who is on your top five or top ten list who is very important, and then. Should I pitch some half-ready, not so bullish thing that could also um, address their needs and potentially ruin the relationship uh, that we have? Like, uh, have you had any any similar issues? Like, uh, or or maybe it's just me, because I'm from Darfur. Just you. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. No, <laughs> we were quite aggressive uh, when we released Team Week. We were quite aggressive, like uh, cross-selling uh, to our existing users. Uh, but what we found out the hard way was that the churn was incredibly high. So people tried it out and then just uh, left. So apparently, even if if you are targeting the same like SMEs, productivity tool, uh, SaaS, self-serve sign-up, uh, low price point, still the, the target groups are so different. So it took us uh, almost two years to understand that uh, we can't market the, the new products as we were marketing the old one. And as, as nowadays, I think that uh, every new startup is mostly, it's not, uh, if you're not doing rockets, it's mostly not engineering uh, challenge. It's a go-to-market uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think th that it's very important to have a dedicated marketing team for the new products okay. that is fully committed. You know. but what would you do different uh, now? Like how would you define the market? I don't, I don't know. I think that there is no shortcut in uh, finding product market fit. Even we last year we released a new product. We ha I have been in the startup like for almost 20 years doing different products. Uh, I thought that I knew it all. And you still you launch a new product and you, you feel like you're back to square one. <laughs> yeah. Just you, you need to understand the client and it, you, there are no, no shortcuts. Okay. My, one example that I can mm -hmm. think of is that technology is inherently democratizing complex processes. Like the very typical story uh, of a software product uh, mm -hmm. so that you sell to businesses is that something that very, very large companies used to be able to do, all of a sudden you solve it in software and the marginal cost of having another million users is zero. Hence, like many more, you can lower the prices and many more companies can benefit. And that's one of the places where I think it's a common startup mistake. It's just, the, just because you can, you shouldn't. <laughs> like, like the second you go from a Fortune 500 to Fortune 2000 to any company with 100 employees to any SME in the world, like you will have completely different sales process. You will have completely different uh, marketing channels, completely different. So the software might be exactly the same. Like, like you can still, I don't know, manage your employees. But just by narrowing who you are selling to, uh, is, is something that is super important and super hard to do in the early stages, either starting a new company or launching a new product. So in our case, it's very tempting, and because Teleport comes from the consumer side, and, and we have a lot of sort of consumer software people on the team, we love to sort of have a billion users. Like. <laughs> and and, and so, so the forcing ourselves to say that, okay, yes, let's include that in our product vision, but not in a three-year product strategy. And sort of distinguishing that where your ambitions of sort of going after the long tail and enabling everybody to use the modern sort of data st stuff that you've done, like it's tempting and mm -hmm. it's like feels like it's a, just like a, a button click away. But uh, but uh, exactly for what Alaw is saying, this go to market bit is what what separates if you should do it. Yeah. Okay. So we're almost running uh, out of time. So we had this. Uh, um, two topics, so let's merge them together. Everybody can have their, their words. Um, what are the things you definitely have to do if you want to screw up your new business? And what are the mistakes to avoid in general? So similar things. Let's start from here. 
Yeah, I do's mean, and I th don'ts. I think I think we already already touched the uh, touched upon most of it, but I, I really think it's it's about uh, prioritizing. Like, don't try don't try to do too many things at once. Uh, make sure that there's a relevance to what you're doing. So even if you end up like what you did, like launching it as two separate products because there's not a spillover, there's still a relevance in the competencies of the people behind it. So you can use those skills. And then if you decide to go with something, you have to you have to go all the way. Uh, because you can't if you, if you make a product that and test it out where it's too minimal, it's not it's not going to be it's just a waste of resources because if you if you just half-ass it, then people will not react positively to it in any way. Um, so yeah, just relevance demand and, and really choose which ones to do and then do it properly. I think that the easiest uh, uh, route to failure is uh, entitlement that uh, you have had some kind of success already and you think that uh, you are entitled uh, to be successful also with the next product. You are not, <laughs> you have to fight hard. Yeah. And, and the flip side of that yeah. is that, I think a pretty common mistake is that you start to work on product number two before product number one has product market fit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like, it might be even like, founder psychology is that you, you kind of like if the first thing is flatlining, it's not sort of going through the roof, then you start sort of experimenting and you, you're already thinking of new things that could work better. <laughs> and, and it's important that either you make the first thing work or you, you recognize that it's a pivot that you shut the first thing down or, or hibernate it or like very quickly you might have uh, otherwise like a small team of five people trying to maintain five products uh, which will never work or, or it's, it's a guarantee for none of them to become successful. And that's something that we struggled with at, at Teleport was that, as I, as I, as I mentioned, we, we launched sort of things that looked like products as experiments to prove some hypotheses or some points or some metrics or something like that. It's super important to have the discipline to actually say what you're going to prove and then measure it and then two months or six months later to say, did it work or not, and then move on or, or invest in it or like make those decisions. Just that you have a more and more things running in parallel is, is very risky if you never move away from the ones that don't work. Yeah, I, I think uh, there are like uh, exactly as you said, like two stages. Like when uh, when you're a company and you're still trying to find the product market fit, then you you oftentimes tend to sort of try to juggle too many balls at the same time. Maybe this works, maybe this works, maybe this works, and eventually you have like ten different uh, directions where to go, and uh, and then. Yeah, then, then it ends as it typically ends, right? And the other sort of thing what I've seen is, is what, uh, what uh, Alare said. You have managed to get some sort of success and then you feel like a god. So basically everything I touch turns into gold. Uh, I had that feeling once. Um, <laughs> what happened then? <laughs> um, the water didn't turn into wine and then didn't get any gold either. Uh, but 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 yeah, like to to have sort of semi-successful product and then start doing a lot of things uh, can be difficult, and, and then you start doing putting like too much money into things that uh, where you shouldn't. But yeah, since we have some time, maybe you guys have some some sort of ideas how to how to sort of realize that uh, you've gone mad a bit and, and try to do everything because. Like you're in Estonia, you're looking, Taxify is doing awesome, they're all over the world. I'm not doing super well, I'm making like five million a year. We're in 10 countries, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good startup founder, so I need to do some new stuff. So how, how, how should I sort of feel that uh, sometimes less is better, if at all? I think, I think if, you're, if you're looking at Taxify and making decisions based on your feelings of regret, then there is something wrong in some earlier layers of, of how you run your business. I think, I think very, very um, important there is the discipline around your core product. Like if you have your product well instrumented, if you discuss with your team, you know which are the levers you can pull to make it better. You know 
where do your customers drop off, you know, why is your NPS score not as high as, as it could be, then you actually have a massive laundry list of making the core better. And so, the, so the, the, that should keep any, any entrepreneur busy for years and decades, right? So, so, so that sense of our, our product cannot be made better, I think, comes from the fact that you, you don't know enough about your current product, which for me is a signal you should focus there more. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of the opposite of switching to something else. But should I sort of go and have multiple products, multiple companies as a founder? I think that uh, one effect that I have had uh, with having multiple products, multiple companies, is that uh, you can uh, experiment, you can, you can do things differently in different companies, and you can learn faster. And for example, we have uh, implemented a lot of like, things that we learned in a smaller company, we have implemented in, uh, in the bigger one. So it's like, uh, it, it has been quite interesting uh, effect, side effects that you can, uh, you can learn from like new companies because if you have like existing business uh, you have to keep it stable you have to like keep your clients happy and uh, the bigger you are the less uh, likely you are to take uh, like new initiatives new risks better, better keep it stable so you, you you were bored so that's yeah. why you started with new stuff i uh, maybe uh, yeah i think i think the the question of multiple companies is simpler it's almost like asking mm -hmm. like do you want to be an entrepreneur or do you want to be a vc mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think the difference there is that as a VC, there are a few founders, like, I don't know, Peter Thiel has been a co-founder in three or four sort of billion dollar companies, and my co-founder at Teleport, Palaji Srinivasan, has been a co-founder in a number and so forth. So you can technically do it, but basically after you have more than one company, you're very quickly getting to a territory where you are a board member. Mm -hmm. So as one of my VC friends uh, once told me that, uh, that like, um, every time I go to a launch party, I'm still a guest. <laughs> and that's the definition of sort of not being in there, not being the one that builds it. And if you have that drive, uh, then it probably makes sense to focus on one company and probably not too many products. Then you actually can be hands on in building something and operating something. Okay. So um, uh, Luis wants to kick us out soon. So we, we need to wrap it up uh, from my side. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I uh, also would want to add that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a strong believer of uh, customer-centric growth. So whether it's feature, whether it's a new, new product, so depending on the customers and seeing the market opportunity, uh, and all sorts of innovation should, should rather, in the first place, yeah, contribute to the, to the feature set and not necessarily sort of new products, but it, it all depends on, on, the, on the companies, clearly. But thank you very much. Let's do a big round of applause to, to our experts. Thank you.